This is RJ Carbone, and you're listening to BD4. Anthony for three. Bang! That one goes down. This one by Mattingly. Oh, hang on to the RJ Barrett does it again from down. He is just tearing the Orioles apart. It's good. It's good. Randall gets the bounce, and he ties the game. Showing some dexterity as well with the left hand. Yankees win. Yankees win. We are back. That's right, that's right. We're back. Welcome to another episode of the show. This is episode 319. 319 of BD4, where there is no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. And we also do MMA now too. In fact, we're doing Knicks, Yankees, and MMA in this episode. We're going to try to touch on on all three. Um, The main focus, I want to focus and recap this Knicks game from last night, which, yeah, it it was something. Uh, And I also want to focus on the uh, UFC event. Fight Night 200, Vegas 47, was it? That took place last night as well. And then if we have time in the end, um, well, maybe we'll mix this in the middle, but we'll we'll try and find room for the Yankees because there's been a rumor going on there. But welcome to the show. Welcome once again to BD4, where there's no better way to get your Yankees next analysis, and we do MMA now too. Just said that. Um, If you are new here, be sure to subscribe to the podcast. You can find BD4 on many platforms. You know, you can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, on Joe Rogan's Spotify, on, on uh, I hate this world, SoundCloud, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Anchor, many other listening platforms. But if you want to watch, if you want to watch the video format of this podcast, it's up on YouTube. So just search BD4 on YouTube, although it's it's buried in the algorithm. So <laughs> going to have to type in some keywords like Yankees or Knicks. But um, along with BD4, but um, that's it. That's that's all I want to let you know. And also, of course, be sure to follow me on social media. I'm on Facebook, RJ Carbone. I'm also on Instagram at Rob J Carbone. As I am recording, it's the night after. The night after all these events and pieces of information occurred. It is a six. It's six forty-five on a Sunday night, February sixth. As I am recording, as this podcast is out, it should at least be late night, February sixth. Or maybe you're listening to this Monday morning, the 7th. On your way to work, you know, because who wouldn't want to listen to BD4? (laughs) Um, So welcome to the show. I don't know if anybody follows the Winter Olympics, but yes, the Olympics started up on the 3rd. Been watching that a lot since it's jump-started, and it's been good. I, I like the Olympics, man. Summer, winter, whatever it is, I like the fact that it brings you different sports than your usual four or five, right? Things you don't often get to watch. So I'm into it. I'm into it for sure. And I love that it's, you know, the Olympics are on all 24-7 basically. So you get to watch it when you're in bed trying to fall asleep. It's on in the morning on the weekends. So it's a pretty reliable thing to go to right now when, you know, I have to wait for the Knicks to come on later in the night. I'll just throw on the Olympics in the meantime. You know what I mean? So I've been watching that. Um, Right now, watching this Atlanta-Dallas basketball game. Mavs taking on the Hawks. But that's it. Welcome. And um, we'll get right into it. We'll... we'll, (laughs) We got a lot to go over. We do. Uh, I want to try to keep this episode within the hour. 
you know, I want to try to finish recording this before 8 o'clock, I want to say. Right now it's 6.47. So we'll try to keep this about an hour long at best, at most. It'd be nice to fit this all in in like 45 minutes or something. But who knows? We do have some things to discuss. So let's get to our first break, guys. All right, let's get right to it. When we get back, I guess we'll start things off by getting this Knicks team. Let's get this Knicks game out of the way. All right, because this is probably the more miserable. This is going to be the most miserable topic of the three topics we're covering in this episode. Is definitely going to be uh, it's definitely going to be the Knicks. That um, <laughs> that is the most you know pessimistic tone. God, that was something else. So. Let's get to it. Let's get to it before I I start uh before I start falling asleep cuz I am tired. I did a lot of schoolwork today. One of my classes in my one of my I only have one course this semester, but my my one class I've got this plagiarism test that I have to pass before you can do anything, any kind of essay assignment in the class. You have to you have to pass this plagiarism test. And it's such a pain in the ass because you, you'd think that plagiarism is pretty blatant, straight up and simple, but there are different types of plagiarism and there's these long, these long segments of essays you have to read. And uh, and if you fail, you can take it again and again and again, but they mix it up and switch the questions and, uh, and you have to get 9 out of 10 to pass. So it's not like you just have to get a D or higher. You have to actually get a 90% to pass this it's such a pain I've been trying for days now it's just like come on dude so I've been doing that and failing so that's just taking a lot of my energy but um <laughs> before we kill any more of your time let's head to break when we get back from the plug we'll get right into the episode stay with us thank you hey guys so I've noticed that only a small portion of you who watch BD4 on YouTube are actually subscribed. So if you do enjoy this podcast, and maybe you want to be notified when new episodes release, I'd consider subscribing and also hitting that notification bell. This way, we can help the channel grow, and you won't miss a single episode of BD4. Alright, let's get back to it. So, if you guys want to follow me on social media, be sure to do so right now. I'm on Facebook at RJ Carbone, and I'm also on Instagram at Rob J Carbone. Once again, if you want to find me on Facebook, that is RJ Carbone. Instagram at Rob J Carbone. Well, first of all, this this game, I had a big parlay going for it. Big one. Put down fifty dollars on a four hundred plus uh, on a plus four hundred odds. On Jesus Christ, I can't talk. I put down fifty dollars on plus four hundred odds. It was like a ten pick parlay on this Knicks Lakers game. I hit like. 7 out of 10 within the first half of the game. So I was on pace to kill it. Third quarter comes, I get two more. I'm at 9 out of 10. And friggin' Westbrook. And I know he's having a... He's not the same. He's not the guy who goes out there and drops 30 a night. But 15 points, dude. You couldn't get 15 points. So I miss it. I miss it. I miss out on the extra two, on the extra. I think I would have won two hundred something dollars. Right, it was a fifty fifty dollar parlay on uh, plus four hundred odds. So yeah, two hundred something payout, two fifty payout. Botched because the one leg out of the other ten, Westbrook couldn't get his fifteen points. 
the dude scored five points. And it's it was weird. It was a weird. You know, you, you find yourself in this situation often as a better and a fan of a sports team where if you're betting on a player to score 15 points and he's playing your team, it's kind of like, oh, man, this is tough. And I found myself fighting my own fandom versus fighting my own wallet. You know, it was like, who do I root for? My wallet or my fandom? My passion, whatever. My wallet or my favorite team? There we go. And because um, I wanted Westbrook to get to 15. But he didn't even play towards it. They benched him at the end of the game. So it was a mess. How do you go one for 10 in the basketball game? I mean, I mean, shit. Even Carmelo had his terrible games, but... He found his way to 15 on those off nights. Five points. Five points. Can't win a parlay because Russell Westbrook, known for chucking shots up and shooting and scoring, can't do that to score 15 points. So that put me in a down mood. But, um, I mean, the main story of the night was the fact that the Knicks lost another basketball game. And they did it in the most heart-wrenching way possible. Gut-wrenching, heartbreaking way possible. So they dropped this one, 122 to 115, after overtime. But they head into it, you know, needing a big win. Needing a big win. First game of of a five-game road trip coming up. It starts... Here at Staples Center or or crypto, whatever the hell. And the Knicks come out firing. Okay. Keep in mind LeBron James comes back this game. So the Knicks come out firing. They're blazing hot. Playing some unbelievable basketball. Honestly, it was the best basketball I've seen from them this season. Quick ball movement. Fast break scoring and transition. Constantly pushing the pace. I mean, they scored 25 points on the break in the game, but 19 of those points came in the first half. They were in the half court. They were getting into their sets early. And then on the other end of the floor, they were hustling on defense. They were very active. You had R.J. Barrett and Julius Randle coexisting very nicely. Playing off each other. Both were on fire. They were hooping. Each of them had over 20 points at halftime. RJ had 17 points in the first quarter. Where the Knicks scored a season high. 42 points in the first. For points in a quarter. So it looked great. By halftime we're up 71-56. Shooting 50% from the field. 45% from three. 17 assists on the 24 makes we had. The Lakers were held to 2 for 14 three-point shooting. They looked bad. There was no energy. Getting called out on the telecast. Getting booed in the arena. It was bad. And things looked great. But I felt it. And I'm sure you felt it coming. The old uh, regression to the mean was bound to happen, and that that more than happened in that second half as the switch completely flipped. 180. Unlike anything I've seen before, they had a 21-point lead midway through the second quarter. The Knicks go out in the second half of the third quarter and just completely disappear. Their offense is gone. And credit to to Frank Vogel for adjusting and going with the switch everything defense. Lakers did a lot of switching in that second half. And that threw the Knicks off. But the Knicks completely collapse. They scored 13 points in the third quarter. And had 44 total points in the entire second half. So meaning the third quarter, the fourth quarter, and in overtime they scored 44 points. They scored 42 in the first quarter. So, that's some perspective for you. They couldn't stop any... They they couldn't stop Malik Monk. Malik Monk, I think he had 29 points, but 18 of them maybe were in the third quarter. 
And the Knicks were entering the fourth quarter down three points all of a sudden. But they did make a run. They did kind of salvage things a bit in the fourth. The Lakers started missing their free throws, which the Knicks didn't make theirs either, but the Lakers somehow worse at 60%. They went 4 for 11 from the line in the second half. The Lakers did. RJ, of course, in a career night with 36, 8, and 5, hits the big shot again. He hits that big three-pointer on the break with eight seconds left. Fournier drives and dishes it to RJ. Pulls up off the catch. And the game's tied 111-111 with eight seconds to go. And it goes to overtime. But of course, in overtime, the Knicks don't show up. They completely melt in overtime. No offense. Uh, They're making mental mistakes. Fournier, I don't know what the hell... That boneheaded garbage play was to start the overtime period with Fournier. We'll talk about him. And then, of course, the old Tom Thibodeau offensive playbook in full effect once again, too, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you had the Lakers playmaking out there. But the Knicks just running their free-for-all offense. They were running a free-for-all offense once again. And that was it. The fat bitch sang her song, and that was it. So, you know, the only thing I really have to say, and I'm going to try and make this quick because, again, we have other things that I actually want to talk about in this episode with the UFC and with the Yankees. But the one thing I do just want to make a point on I'm getting very tired. And I, it's hard for me to say it because, again, I, I like the guy. But I'm getting very tired of having you talk about the same issues over and over and over and over and over again. And with Tom Thibodeau, it's become exhausting. I am not saying the Knicks need to fire him. So I want to make that clear. But at the end of the season, the Knicks do need to be thinking about some things when it comes to tips. They should consider some things and get it together. Depending on how the rest of this season plays out, things may have to happen. Because with this rotation, it continues to be the same problems. With his ATO offense, which continues to lack, why is Burks always, always involved in these inbound actions? If we can even call them actions, because again, it's basically a free-for-all offense. But it's that, it's the rotation. Oh my gosh. So, I want to get to the rotation. Once again. Alright, I want to get to it. I want to talk about some things when it comes to the Nick rotation. Particularly in this game. So, we're going to head to break one more. Um, And when we get back, we'll keep it... We'll we'll, we'll try and keep it short. But I want to complain about some things (laughs) when we get back on this rotation. Stay with us. So BD4 is on so many platforms to listen to. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud. You can listen to us on Spotify. You can find us on our sponsor, Anchor, and many other listening platforms as well, wherever you get your podcasts. But we are also available to watch on YouTube. So if you want to watch us on YouTube, go subscribe there. But if you prefer to listen to us, again, many, many, many listening platforms. Just be sure to subscribe, download, give us a rating, a review, comment, share the podcast, and all that fun stuff. 
This is BD4, where there's no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. So once again, it was the third quarter to me. It was the third quarter where Thibodeau leaves the starters in there practically the entire time. Just leaves them out there to die. Not the entire time, but for a good chunk of the quarter. I mean, you had Kemba out there on one leg. Cooked. Once again, gassed. Clearly didn't have it. His confidence was gone. He was passing up wide open layups on fast breaks. He gets about eight minutes too many in the third. Mitchell Robinson clearly needed in that quarter. Clearly, the Lakers make a huge run. LeBron's getting to the cup, torching Noel at the five. Noel being put in a blender in these pick and roll actions in the drop coverage. Anthony Davis eating up on the glass without Mitch out there. You know, you have Tibbs and his whole BS mantra, 48 minutes of rim protection. It's old, dude. It's way too old. You got to change it up. I'm sorry. Nerlens, I, I appreciated his productive season last year, but he can't keep going out there. And, and he gave them 23 minutes last night of nothing. Not only is it the offense, he's got no hands, he drops everything he touches, but he, he's just getting burnt. The Knicks got burnt defensively in that third when Mitch was out of the game. And it was a recurring theme throughout whenever he was go- went to the bench. So is it that bad to think about playing Jericho Sims? Or, okay, you, want, you don't want to play him in a game like this, Obi Top in some more minutes? I mean, I would have even given Mitch more than 30 minutes in an overtime game. Noel was clearly way too overmatched. He was undersized against Anthony Davis to begin with. So I felt like 30 minutes for Mitch was not enough. And I felt like when he was on the floor, Mitch, even offensively, they didn't really utilize him as much as they should have as a rim runner. They didn't give a, they didn't give him any looks. He had three, maybe four shot attempts, and I don't think... I have to go back, but I'm pretty sure none of them, maybe one or two, were generated by the team. They were, uh, I don't think they were rim runs. They were just offensive rebounds. But still, even if you know, all four would have been, it's four shot attempts in 30 minutes, dude. Should have gotten him into more actions with R.J. Barrett. Quickly, R.J. was hot. Best player on the team, he's hot. But he, once again, even gets iced. Parts of the second half. Third quarter, he had four shot attempts. Well, you have guys like Fournier, Randall, Kemba, combining for 13 together. Your best player on the team should be getting more shots than four. Coming out the gate in the second half. He was hot. Fourth quarter comes, overtime comes. Does Alec Burks really need to be playing the entire time in the final two frames? Is it really necessary? Did we really give away a first round pick for Cam Reddish if we're not going to play the guy? In a game where clearly we needed that fast break transition play more because it was working like hell in the first half. It was working excellent. We gave them hell working in the fast break. Second half, we slowed the pace down. We were not the same team. The energy was gone. We were not that same team. Couldn't give Cam Reddish some minutes there. Burks was missing shots like crazy. He did generate 12 points on 7 shots, but he was getting to the line. It wasn't within the rhythm of the offense, a lot of it. Cam Reddish should have got some time. Obi, he should have got some time. Grimes, you know, despite struggling in maybe 15 minutes in a 5-period game, he should have got some more time. And I don't give a damn that Emmanuel quickly struggled too in his minimal time out there. By Tibbs' BS veteran logic, that shouldn't matter. But he doesn't hold the youth to the same standards for some reason. They're on some tight leash, and IQ has been their best second unit playmaker ever since D-Rose went down. 
It's not been close. He's their only true playmaker on the second unit. So, you know, it's not just on Thibodeau. It's just sometimes it's the lack of having a gosh damn point guard. It, it was pretty evident last night. Man, do we need a point guard. Oh my gosh. I was never high on Brunson. I, I The rumors kind of just dull to me, but I, I take it at this point, dude. We need a point guard. But it's like in the meantime, okay? In the meantime, when Kemba's clearly burnt, he's done. When, when Alec Burks has to play point guard out of position all the time, why can't we switch it up and go with Emmanuel quickly there? I mean, you saw Vogel bench Westbrook, his point guard, for Horton Tucker, who was over at the time, coming into the game late. So we couldn't do something like that with Emmanuel quickly? I thought quickly could have gotten a little, another look there. I, I just think it's time for Tibbs to adopt. He must adopt. Be a little bit flexible, dude. Just a little flexible. And and the easy thing to say again is is the players are not doing their jobs. The roster is very clunky, inconsistent. But, but, but when you hear that from somebody, that's how you know that that person is not investing their time into watching the Nick games. Because those same guys who are not getting it done, inconsistent, clunky, those same guys are being left out there for super long, super extended stretches in the second half of games. So he's not doing much to adjust in-game. And that's somewhat disgraceful to me. So if these inconsistent players that we talk about are not doing their jobs, plug in one of the kids for a few more minutes. See what he can do. And I'm repeating myself, I know. So it's, it's very frustrating to, to continue to have to sit there and watch Tom Thibodeau do his thing. And I mean that in a bad way this year. Do his thing. At least Randall had a good game. He scored 32 points. He had 16 rebounds, 7 assists, 2 blocks, and he shot over 50%. In the first half, he looked phenomenal. He looked like last year's version of Randall. Making quick, snappy decisions with the ball. He wasn't doing the excessive ISO. He was sprinting without the ball offensively. He was hustling back and playing defense. Holding his own against tough tough competition. Excuse me, Anthony Davis and sometimes LeBron. He really made an effort to push the pace in that first half, which was great to see. Because he's a big reason as to why our offenses ran so slow. Randall likes to slow it down often and play that half-court game, but he was making a true effort to push everybody in up that tempo in the first half. Second half, kind of returned to form a bit. He had a pretty abysmal third quarter where he wasn't even, I don't know what happened, but he wasn't even getting a hand up and contesting shots, failing to close out multiple times on, on Trevor Ariza. He refused to crash and box out and Gave away so many possessions doing that. And then he had that late turnover in the fourth that pretty much capped it off. So he had some really rough moments in the second half. But, you know, I want to try to give him the benefit of the doubt because in the end, he scored 32 of the Knicks' points. He had 16 of their rebounds. He had 7 assists, 2 blocks. Again, 50%. All right, so so the bad defensive lapses are, are inexcusable. I'm not making an excuse for them. But this was a better performance from Randall than we've seen in a whole long time. And I love the fact, again, I'm going to go back to it. I love the fact that he was at least trying to, to put forth an effort to push that pace in the first half. I don't look at this game as, as an indicator. I'm done trying to get my hopes up. But if there's one thing that we've seen consistently from Randall lately is that he continues to take less shots than R.J. Barrett out there. And I love that. He knows who his daddy is. And R.J. Barrett is his daddy. R.J. went for 36 points last night. 8 rebounds, 5 assists, and he shot 46%, 13 for 28. 
I guess he's the only true positive from uh, during this game from first quarter to the last. He continues to establish himself, in my opinion, as the clear-cut best player on the Knicks. I think so. I think it's it's their numbers are very similar now to where you can actually make that case and not have anybody look at you like, what? And especially when you look at the numbers, not only, but you look at their, their defense. RJ has the big edge there. Even though RJ's defense is not great, it's miles better than Julius. You look at the efficiency, RJ has the slight uptick there. He's the better passer when you consider he gets significantly less ball reps over the course of the entire season. Now it's kind of more towards RJ, and we're seeing that. with the, you know His stats are better than Julius's over the last month or so. Um, and just the fact that he doesn't, RJ doesn't melt down in the clutch. And not only does he not melt down, he actually steps up in the clutch. And we're starting to see him hitting these big shots more consistently now. He's clearly, the, the in my opinion, the best winning impact player on the team. And I would honestly put Derrick Rose, when healthy, second. But RJ's playing with so much confidence right now. You can see it. The ways in which he was scoring show you that. I mean, dunking on Davis late in the game, the dream shake on Westbrook, the game-tying shot with eight seconds left, spinning off of guys. He just looked like he was having fun. And I love that he is doing so many things on the fast break door in this stretch. He's getting his rebounds, and he's leading the fast break offense. He's making good reads as a playmaker on the break. And he's also making good reads when going to the rim. So, I just think the Knicks, you know, the Knicks have to keep this pace in mind if they want to properly develop R.J. Barrett. This is why I can't wait until they move Kemba, and I think they will, whether that be finding a partner for him or just waiving the contract. Um, and hopefully Fournier can be gone too, but I'm not as optimistic there. But get the guys out who dominate the ball and play that slower pace. And start playing the guys like Ham Reddish more, who can adopt to this fast-paced style of play that the Knicks should be playing at. And I'm not saying the Knicks have to go out there and play like the, I don't know, give me a fast-paced team, the Milwaukee Bucks, the Phoenix Suns. But just be closer to average, because they're, li- they're 30 at 30 right now in pace. So can you be 15 or better around that mark? It'd be nice to just be somewhat fast. The Cavs just traded for Ka- uh, for Karis LeVert with Indiana. Oh, looks like that Indiana fire sale is uh, is legit. Did I say, I, th- I think Rubio is involved in that deal. Oh, new, oh yeah, Indiana gets Rubio. I think it's a second round pick. Alright, so here we go. We're going to start seeing more moves day by day now. Right on cue as we're talking about the trade deadline. But I love what RJ's doing. Um, again, the, the team needs to start adopting. Need to. Also, like last night, uh, I'm starting to notice that Kemba doesn't have the very few good good offensive nights he has. He doesn't have them when the offense is emphasized around RJ and, and Randall. You know, so when he's... When he's on the ball, he's not really getting anybody else involved. And when he's off the ball, he doesn't do enough defensively to mitigate taking that back seat. And then you can't rely on him to stay healthy. That's a whole other thing. So <laughs> I just think he needs to go. Um, and for Fournier, he had 15 points. But after that nice start where he knocked down a couple of threes and then got into the lane and finished, he vanished again. Especially in the fourth quarter, overtime. <laughs> You're paying this guy $73 million dollars to hit big big shots for you down the stretch, and he can't do that. Meanwhile, Malik Monk was torching Evan in that third, fourth quarter. Torching him. Making $1 million. And having the better season, too. He's having the better season. And, and again, that boneheaded decision by Evan. Saving a ball that would have clearly been out of bounds on the Lakers. But instead, he gets the ball, and he basically gets an assist to LeBron James for a dunk. It was one of those play smart, not hard moments. Yeah. 
But um, like I'm saying, RJ's balling out, so I love that he's finally become that guy. Um, he's dropping 20-plus consistently for us. He's got the average up to 17.9. It's career high. I hope he can do that enough to get that 20-point average by the end of the season. That'd be nice. It's going to be hard. But, you know, I was looking after this game on NBA.com, thinking about that, that clutch shot he hit, and I'm looking at the clutch numbers. RJ, man, I'll tell you what. So, in the clutch, and by in the clutch, that's considered the last five minutes of a five-point game. So, in the clutch this season, R.J. Barrett is averaging 2.8 points per game. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it's 24th among the 335 qualifiers. He's also shooting 64%, 18 for 28 in the clutch, with a 62%, 8 for 13, three-point percentage. 75 at the line. Meanwhile, I'm looking at Julius's in the clutch numbers. He's 38%. 15% from three, two for 13. 65% at the line. Averaging 1.7 points. So, it's not just the eye test. You're seeing it in the games. And then I'm looking at the last 10 seconds of a three-point game. Those numbers. RJ's now got two shots because remember he hit that buzzer beater. So he's tied with nine other guys for second place in the NBA with two field goals made in the final 10 seconds of a three-point game. I think D'Lo has three to lead the league. Randall has uh, as many as you and I do. So (laughs) that's easy math there. Um, So I thought he had a good game, and it's it's good that he continues to to be on this stretch, and it's it's looking like it's more sustainable by the day, hopefully. And I also like that he... I, I thought RJ defended... Uh, pretty well last night, especially when he was paired up with LeBron. When he was tasked with LeBron, I thought he did a pretty job, pretty good job, you know, staying in front of him and, and doing as best as he could with LeBron James. So it was a good game for RJ. That's the positive, and that's that's the positive of the of the Knicks team this season, is that RJ is finally uh, taking that next step, especially you know since the end of December up to now he seems to be on a good roll but I mean that's it you know uh, the Knicks lose in the end (laughs) and in the end it's about the team not one player but it is a positive Um, it's just I'm I'm done with losing man it's tough you know that's it so the West Coast trip will now define how we handle Thursday's deadline I'm thinking Um, so we dropped the first one but now we've got a back-to-back coming up Monday, Tuesday. And uh, I, I say sell-off. I honestly say just become sellers. Tell these vets to take a hike and clear up room on the roster for Cam, McBride, and other guys. You know, uh, give up trying to make the plan just to get washed in the first round if you even make it past the plan. The Knicks, though, I, I, I guess they think differently. I don't know. I mean, I would love a big move too. By the way, you know, I would love. I would not mind Turner. Again, I'm, I'm I'm buying into Mitch more and more a little every day, but I still wouldn't hate a Miles Turner trade. All depending on what they give up. I, I would take Fox, but Randall would have to be moved in that deal. Realistically speaking, though, I don't think we're getting any any kind of blockbuster deal, unfortunately. So, uh, again, I just say give up on on trying to push so hard for just to be in the same position as last year in the very end and just try to develop this youth. So that's it. Uh, let's move on to the, uh, I guess we'll get to the Yankees. You know, we'll briefly talk about them before we get to the uh, UFC card last night. All right, so let's head to break. When we get back from this plug, we'll start talking Yankees. Stay with us. All right, folks. Now, if you are listening to BD4 on Apple Podcasts, be sure to give us a five-star rating and a review, if you so please. So once again, this is if you are listening to BD4 on Apple Podcasts, give us a five-star rating and review. Thank you. So 
So it's, again, uh, this little Yankees tidbit is going to be a short one uh, just because there's a lockout going on and it's not much of a, it's not so much news. It's just uh, more of a rumor, if anything. Um, so we're hearing that the Yankees, I think Heyman reported it, are considering checking in on, on uh, Freddie Freeman once the lockout concludes, which who knows when the hell that's going to happen. They're interested, apparently. <laughs> you know, is it just hearsay because of the lockout and it's just a bunch of hot air nonsense? It could be, you know. Um, is it the Yankees leaking this information to try and lower Oakland's demand for Matt Olson? Possibly that too. Uh, or is it from Freeman's camp to try and drive the price up? You know, letting everybody else know, hey, the Yankees are in, the Yankees are in. And everybody goes, oh, well, the Yankees are an aggressive team, you know, to help Freeman get more money. I don't know. Or are they genuinely interested in Freeman? <laughs> you know, I mean, they did move prospects at the trade deadline last year to bring in the veteran Anthony Rizzo because they don't trust Luke Voigt's health. So it could be. Um, You, you look at Freddie Freeman. He's 32 years old. Lefty. Brings some power. Contact. Fielding. He's a great all-around first baseman. He's a one-time MVP. Right? He is a... What was he? A six-time All-Star? Five-time All-Star. World Series champion now. Three-time Silver Slugger winner. Got a gold glove in that resume. He's a good solid 12-year vet. <laughs> to say the least. Career 295, 893 hitter. With a career 138 OPS+. plus. See, I'm hip. I'm with it. I like the analytics. Playoffs, he's a 290, 916 hitter. Love the sound of that. Coming off a year where he batted 300 with an 896 OPS, 31 bombs, 83 runs driven in. Now, Freeman, I wouldn't consider him a primary need. So do the Yankees want to overpay with the Braves involved and probably the Dodgers in these sweepstakes too? For the veteran Freeman in a position they don't exactly need the most help in. And you've got DJ LeMayu and Luke Voigt as possibilities right now. I like LeMayu in his natural position best. I like him at second base. And with Voigt and his health concerns, although he says he's healthy right now, and, and the defensive concerns... It seems like the Yankees aren't as high on him anymore. They could also re-sign Rizzo for cheaper, maybe a three-year deal or something like that. But I'm hearing, you know, Freeman wants a lot of money. He wants, uh, from what I've been reading about, 180 to 200 million across six years, and that's the big number, six. So it's a $30 million average annual salary. But the rumors are saying the Braves don't want to go past that sixth year. or past They, they don't want to give him that sixth year. The Braves are trying to stay at five. And of course, the, the, his market for him, and the, the whole thing could change with the lockout depending on how this plays out. But he's making he'll, he'll be making a ton of money regardless. And I'm not sure. I'm still not sure I want to pay a guy who's pushing his mid-30s that much money. Because it's not like he'll get better from here. Um, I'm honestly, I'm willing to though. On a few occasions. One is if the Yankees don't significantly upgrade their roster elsewhere. Okay. And also, if it comes down to Freeman or Olsen, and the Yankees don't stick with Voight, 
and they, they want LeMay to play second. And it comes down to trading for Olsen or signing Freeman. Honestly, I, I don't want Olsen. <laughs> I don't. And again, this is only if they don't upgrade the roster significantly elsewhere. I would consider Freeman. If it comes to Freeman or Olsen, I would consider Freeman. I'm not a fan of the swing and miss sluggers with holes in their swing. From what I can remember, I think Olsen has a big, kind of like Gallo, uppercut in his swing as well. So we've already got one of those guys with Gallo. Not to mention we've got right-handed swing and miss guys too, like Gary and Stanton. They're not exactly great contact hitters. So we're talking, you know, a bunch of guys in this lineup who will be whiffing at unbelievable rates, especially when they slump. And you all know my opinion on that, right? I've said it so many times on the show before. And so honestly, I don't think the Yankees are going to... I don't think they're willing to move their top prospects. In fact, there was even that report a couple days ago on Volpe and on Peraza saying that they want to keep those guys. They're actually, you know, as much shit as we give the Yankees, they're willing to pay more than they are to move their high-end prospects. Right? They're more than willing to pay the contracts of big names. Excuse me. Um, And I don't think Oakland's going to ask for anybody else. I think they're going to start at Volpe and Peraza, and I'm not sure how much negotiating they'll be there. You know, because Olsen's a big name. He's a pretty big name. So, yeah, it, it would be nice, and you can even envision it, right? Freddie Freeman, lefty power inside Yankee Stadium, playing in the American League East. Put him right next to, or right in between Judge and Stanton. Freeman is a guy who was able to put the bat on the ball, too. He's a complete hitter much like Judge, without the strikeouts. And he plays defense in the corner. He's durable, (laughs) like Gardner, but also unlike Gardner, he's a veteran leader who's actually productive for you at the plate. Feels like he could be a great Yankee. You could picture it. I just don't know how legitimate these rumors are. And it is risky as hell. You know, the Yankees could be using this money, again, elsewhere on more primary needs like shortstop. Uh, I would prefer uh, center field even. Uh, The rotation. (laughs) And keep in mind, they could very well be trying to save for that Aaron Judge extension. Because he will be a free agent in the winter, next winter. So they do need to do something significant, like I said. I would just prefer we look at other... You know, explore other options, as the Yankees like to say first. With Correa, uh, I'm still hoping for him, although I don't know. <laughs> you know, But, I mean, I, uh, Marte, maybe? But if you want to get more into my thoughts on the, that thing, on, on the Yankees filling other voids and stuff, check out episode 309, which was about two weeks ago or so. We got into that stuff. So episode 309 of the podcast, I'll try and put it, If you're on YouTube watching the podcast, I'll try and put the uh, link on the screen if I can remember. But just go to my page, episode 309, wherever you are, whichever platform, and you'll find uh, the episode where I talk about the Yankees filling their voids around the diamond. All right. And I was reading about this Freeman thing in a comment section. (laughs) Somebody made up a quote, you know, mocking Cashman, and it was... uh, I was just dying laughing because you know I could just imagine Cashman repeating the same exact statement. I'm paraphrasing here, but it was like the Yankees on Freeman. Uh, we did our due diligence. Uh, in the end, we didn't feel comfortable going past four years. While we congratulate the Dodgers for signing such a great player, uh, you know we put our utmost confidence in Luke Voigt. Blah blah. blah. <laughs> just I could I could see that shit right now coming out of Brian Cashman's mouth. Uh, so that's it. Well, as far as the Yankees go, that, that's the whole Freeman news that's been going around. So I do it uh, just, again, on occasion. It depends what we, what we do elsewhere. But, um, yeah, the Yanks want Freddie, S- apparently. Uh, again, so we'll have to see how true this is as the offseason plays out. But 
tell you what, whenever this lockdown uh, lockout does end, it's going to get noisy because we still have a lot of unsigned players and I'm sure they're making moves as we speak, setting things up. So we'll see. Let's head to our final break. When we get back, we will talk about this MMA card last night. Stay with us. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying this episode. But first, I also want to let you know I have another blog. The blog I'm writing for is on ultimatesportsnetworks.com titled The Bomber Bocker Blog. If you want to go subscribe to this blog, you should do so using my promo code 6A2841ERJC. Using that, you'd get a discount $7.99 a month to get the best Knicks and Yankees opinionated content around. Once again, guys, the Bomber Bocker blog on ultimatesportsnetworks.com using promo code 6A2841ERJC, $7.99 a month. A custom wall tapestry is a surefire way to uplift any room's aesthetics with a personal touch. This 100% polyester wall tapestry comes with hemmed edges for extra durability while its mildew and water resistant properties ensure years worth of decorating bliss. The advanced tapestry printing techniques guarantee crisp detail even for the craziest of designs in any of the multiple size choices. You can select a size of 26 by 36 inches, 51 by 60, 68 by 80, and 88 by 104. These wall tapestries usually ship in 7 to 10 business days, and the price ranges from $24.99 to $69.99, all dependent on the size you select. The Bomber Bocker blog wall tapestries come in orange, gray, and black. But most importantly, be sure when purchasing a wall tapestry for the Bomber Bocker blog that you use promo code 6A2841ERJC. 6A2841ERJC. Just go to ultimatesportsnetworks.com and click on the Shop MVP tab, searching the Bomber Bocker blog. And there you have it. All right, so we'll finish this thing up, talk about some MMA, because it was a good, fun uh, UFC event last night. You know, it was, it was, it wasn't bad. Um, so, Fight Night Two Hundred. Uh, just a brief run, uh, a brief run through of some of the prelims I watched on the undercard. The very first fight, the uh, very first fight of the early prelims, nasty. <laughs> it was tough to watch. The um, What's the kid? Bondar broke his elbow or his arm or something. He had a nasty injury. You could see it. It was just all dislocated. He loses to uh, Gordon. It was, it was, it was, I don't know these guys' names, the early prelim guys, but it was something Gordon or Gordon something. But yeah, welcome to the UFC, uh, Bondar. You also screwed up my first parlay legs, so thanks. Just kidding. <laughs> Second fight was, was good. Um, Roe gets the finish on Wit uh, with a beautiful combo. Right hand, he went right hand, left hook, right, left, right, left, right. And then they called it stoppage also one of my parlay picks and I hit that one <laughs> third fight comes he had Almeida I remember this guy from from the Dana uh, from Dana White's contender series in, in September I remember watching his fight there he's got a great ground game um very good physical shape you could see he just dude's pumped um this was his first UFC fight going up against some boxer Marquez but Marquez didn't have a chance to box because Almeida takes him to the ground within the first five seconds, maybe, and he eventually 
got into top position and just had total control. He started throwing hammer fists repeatedly, and that shit was over in seconds. So that happened. That was a good, it was a fun, exciting moment. Fourth fight comes, uh, your first female fight of the night. You had Davis versus Stoliarenko. Stoliarenko. Um, first fight to go to decision of the night. Uh, the whole thing was basically on the ground. Stoliarenko had that up kick early, but no points were taken away. Uh, she was on her back most of the most of the fight, you know. And Bisping made a good point, saying that Stoliarenko is excellent with the armbar. So instead of trying to take it back into stand up, Stoliarenko spent way too much time accepting she was on the ground and, and trying to get in position for that armbar. So it kind of worked against her. And after three rounds, she was just completely bloodied. Davis wins it by points. Uh, this Davis chick is big. I mean, she looked much bigger in my opinion. <laughs> but uh, Maybe it was the knee braces. I feel like knee braces always make you look bigger than you are. Even like when Francis Ngannou wore them in his last fight a couple weeks ago. I don't know. But she was a, this, this Davis chick. She was dominant and ground and pound the entire time. Especially at the end, she went off. Uh, fifth fight of the night. You had an uh, Njokuwani, Inju- Inju- I think his name was. Njokuwani from also from Dana White's Contender Series, debuting against Mark Anthony or Mark Andre, uh, Andre, Mark Andre, Mark Andre Berriolt, the uh, Canadian. This was one of my one of my uh, money line picks for my only other parlay at the time. <laughs> and what do you know? This one too died pretty quickly. Uh, you had Njokuwani with a quick jab, followed by a powerful right. Uh, to drop Mark Andre's ass, and he fell to his ass not 15 seconds into it, and that shit's over. He jumps on him, finishes him, stoppage. So was, and they said after the fight, it was the second fastest finish for a debuting fighter in UFC history, living up to that nickname. Um, I think his nickname is Bang Bang. So, and Joe Kuwani gets the win. Now one and zero in the UFC. Officially under contract, one and zero. Sixth and final fight of the undercard, or no? Sixth was the uh, second to last, I believe. The sixth fight of the undercard. Uh, Canadian Dawadu versus uh, it looks like this kid was an Italian American, Trezano. A very good pace in the first round. Dawadu took control late first with those lead kicks. Um, he had a couple of ex- there were a couple of exchanges where both of them got. Some touches in, um, trading punches at the end there, but second round comes, Trezano stung him early with the right hand and then later connected with a few left hands and left hooks, and I would say that's when kind of, uh, that's when it started to, to go into Dawadu's favor, um, because he, he was just, the dude just looked way too fast for Trezano, uh, he just kept mixing it up and throwing left hand, right hand, left hand, right hand, low body kicks, low kicks, um, Kicks to the body. I'm trying to remember as best I can, but um, Trezano, I just remember him going backwards the entire round. Just looked like uh, Dawadu wasn't in control the entire second round and even the third round. You know, I know Trezano gets that takedown early, but Dawadu was able to bring it back to his feet immediately and he went into the clinch and just kind of coasted his way through the third. Coasted his way through the third with the easy lead. Touched him up a few more times, and that was it. He he took the victory via points, 30-27 unanimous. So, um, at that time, I hit one leg each on two separate parlays because of this fight. It was over two and a half rounds, so that was one of my legs on, on a parlay. And then um, I also had Dawa do the money line. So, <laughs> But the seventh fight comes, and you get Miles Johns completely owned by um, Castanado. I think his name is Sexy Mexi, he calls himself. <laughs> what a dumb nickname. Um, but unfortunately, Johns gets completely owned, and that also messed up my parlay. <laughs> First round, he looked really good. He looked like he was going to take this fight. He was aggressive, attacking Castaneda with combos, and after that, he was just not the same. He was completely messed around. And Castaneda, Castanado, I don't know, the, Mex- the Sexy Mexi. All right. <laughs> he just applies constant pressure. And he had him going backwards the entire time. Third round, he puts him to sleep. He subbed him. And um, that 
was it for all four of my parlays. Great stuff. Thanks, pal. Um, <laughs> and that was the undercard. That was the undercard. Now, the main card was great, too. I, I didn't get to watch much of it because by the time it came around, I was already watching the Knicks. It was about 8.30 as the main card turned. But um, once obviously once the main event took place, Sean Strickland, it was good timing because that came at mostly halftime. But um, I heard the main card was good. I heard the first fight on the main card actually won fight of the night. And one of the other fights you could actually, uh, I think it was the second or third fight. Um, I don't know if you can remember, for those of you who watched the show, but it was uh, season 29. I think these two were, were supposed to fight on the, the Ultimate Fighter season 29 finale. But for some reason that never happened. It was gore in battle. And Battle won this fight. It was close, though. What what two really good last names for fighters? Gore and you got Battle. I don't know if it's pronounced like that, though. For a Battle. I'm pretty sure it was. But um, he makes that funny joke with Bisping in the uh, post-game, in the post-fight interview in the Octagon. He made a, made a joke about Bisping in the eye. Because <laughs> he was all bloody, too. Um... But yeah, it was good. Uh, and then we got to the Strickland Hermanson main event. This. <laughs> so Sean wins by a split decision. We know that. And uh, let me see if I can switch the screen here. Here we go. Sean wins by split decision. I don't know how. Uh, Diamato, man. I, I don't know. This guy, goodness. Uh, I guess he's kind of notorious for this because didn't he score that Michael Chandler fight about eight months ago? Uh, he gave him, you know, he went with a 10 8 that one round, and Dana went at him. He went after him in the presser. But man, how do you score this one in favor of Jack? How did that even happen? How is that even possible for someone to do that? I know nobody dominated the fight, but Sean clearly, he clearly had won the fight. You know, you, you had Sean's coach, you had his team. You know, the media and, and fans, of course, always got to bitch and moan. But uh, all on a witch hunt for this guy, for Diamato, because of his score. I mean, how do you score that in, in Jack's favor? I don't know, man. I don't think that was even close. Um, And yeah, it was a quiet fight. You know, I didn't think it was boring. I wouldn't call it boring. I don't often find fights boring. Um, I, I just think fighting is, is fun no matter how you fight. But I can see why. You know, if you're an impatient, angry, miserable, always won his way, MMA kind of fan, I could see why you'd be bored with this one. Uh, but my take on this fight is pretty interesting. I, the way I'm thinking about it, we all know how Sean is, right? But I honestly think Sean, the way he was talking about him, pre-fight, post-fight, I think Sean respects Jack a lot. So much to the point where I don't think. It was as easy for him to do his thing and carry that murder mentality that he usually carries when he's in the octagon. So in my opinion, I think it was more difficult for him to do his usual, you know, overly aggressive, let me murder you in the octagon thing, right? I think it's easier for Sean to be that guy if he hates his opponent. But it seems like there's a respect there between Sean and Jack Hermanson. And he was kind of speaking about that in the, in the, uh, in the interview after about how disappointed he was in this performance. And he was telling Bisping and telling the media, and also he went on social media to talk about it. I follow him on Instagram. But nonetheless, a win is a win, and he won. So whether you're bitching about it or not, Sean won. He controlled the pace of that entire fight from the get-go, just coasting throughout it and you know, kept touching up Jack with his jab. Jack didn't attempt a ton of takedowns, which is usually his thing. He likes to grapple. But when he did, Sean defended them pretty well up against the fence. Um, you know, Jack was going at him with those low kicks early. You can even make a case that Jack took it 10-9. So I guess that's where Diamato, he had to think he took that one. But, you know, he had, he had that, you know, kind of takedown. Where he didn't really go all the way down, but Sean bounced back up immediately anyway. Um, and then they separated it, and the fight went back to the center of the octagon. Each throwing a few exchanges. Sean kept going at it with that straight right. Some overhands in there. And then, you know, he just kept doing the same thing throughout the fight. 
holding his own, touching him up continuously throughout. Sean wasn't even bleeding. He wasn't even sweating. Seemed like a pretty easy night for him, but at the same time, you know, it felt like he didn't do much. He did just enough to get the clear win. Um, Yeah. Now six in a row for Sean Strickland. Continues to dominate the middleweight division. He's undefeated. Excuse me, undefeated in the middleweight division. 19 and 0, I think. So, what's next now for Sean? Because we've got Israel Adesanya and Rob Whitaker next weekend. All right, so does Sean. So, if, if Izzy wins, let's just say Izzy wins, does Sean get Izzy? It would be some fresh blood for Adesanya because, you know, instead of rematching anybody else, it could be a, you know, a nice change up. If Rob wins, if Rob Whitaker ends up winning in 271, they'll probably schedule the trilogy between him and Israel. That'll set back everybody else in the meantime. But honestly, you know, with the performance, you know, Sean not really dominating like he usually does, even if Izzy wins, it's probably not going to be the winner. Uh, I mean, it's probably not going to be Sean. It's probably going to be the winner of the Cannoneer Brunson fight that will take the winner of that title fight. Right, that's also next weekend. So a lot going on, a lot, of, a lot at stake in two seventy one. I'm excited. So Sean will probably get someone like Vittori or or who Vittori just beat um, the Paulo Costa. I know Costa wants Vittori again, but that's not his call. Um, and, and for Marvin, you know, I know they both train together and there's a respect there between him and Sean, but, you know, if the money's right, I'm sure it'll happen. So, um, and I like both of those fighters. It'll be a fun fight for me to watch because I'm a Marvin Vittori fan. Uh, my best friend Chuck and I always <laughs> talk shit to each other. Um, we, we've been talking shit whenever Marvin fights or Izzy fights because he's an Izzy fan. I think he's got family from from where Izzy was born, and um, I've got family from Italy. <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a Vittori fan, but um, I would love to see. I'm a Sean fan too. I would love to see him fight that that Vittori fight. That'd be a good one. But I'm just not sure. I don't know. It's gonna be interesting to see where Dana White goes with Sean Strickland going forward. Um, but speaking of matchups and stuff, also for the UFC. We heard about the, um, I don't know if I mentioned this yet on the show, I might have a couple episodes ago, or maybe last episode, we're getting that Pena Nunez tough season. We're getting them too. They're going to be coaching um, the Ultimate Fighter season 30 against each other, so I am thrilled for that. That starts in May. Um, for anybody unfamiliar with the Ultimate Fighter, gotta check it out. Gotta check it out, it's amazing. So, Guys, that's it. We're going to head to our NYY, NYK question. NYY, NYK, MMA. God, I got to remember that. Changing it up. We're adding the MMA in there. <laughs> question of the day. Let's get to it. It's time! So for 319, our NYY, NYK, MMA question of the day. Name at least four double champions in UFC history. Name at least four double champions in UFC history. So let me know the answer, whether that be on Facebook or on Instagram. And I'll give you a shout out in the next episode. Guys, thanks so much for tuning in. I'm your host, RJ Carbone, episode 319 in the books. I'll see you in the next one. Ciao. This podcast is brought to you by Anchor. It's the best way to make a podcast. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm.